Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Angelica. Um, hi, Manny. How are you? Good to see you, Pete. I'm great. All right. Excellent. I'm super pumped for our discussion today. Um, Manny, um, for folks who maybe are not, have been like hiding in a rock and might not be familiar with you, maybe you can introduce yourself and, uh, and tell folks a little bit about what you do, you know, what Outreach does and, and what you did before Outreach. Sure. So Outreach is, um, uh, start with me. So uh, I'm Manny Medina, yeah. I'm co-founder and CEO of Outreach. Um, yeah. oh. And Outreach is, is the leading sales execution platform. And sales execution is a category that we are putting together from the combination of both engagement, pipeline generation, deal management, and forecasting. We believe that the entirety of the sales execution needs a category of its own and it needs a set of solutions and a platform of its own. And that's what Outreach does. It allows you to close the different gaps in execution, whether it's, it's pipeline generation uh, with USDRs or AAEs or needing more pipeline from self-generated pipeline from the, from the AEs or deal management to make sure that you have real plan enablement in meetings or that you know what to do, you know, how to engage your buyers in a, in a successful a mutual action plan or take all that information and use that for forecasting so you know you know what are you going to do this quarter and two quarters out uh, that's the bulk of um that's the bulk of what we do um what did i do before uh, i did this outreach is a pivot so before <laughs> outreach, i worked on a company that was the predecessor of outreach that almost went out of business and that's where you and i met because you were my supplier information <laughs> into into what became out good 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 old good old hr tech good old That's hr right. tech i love that space <laughs> great space <laughs> Uh, wonderful. Well, um, I'll just introduce myself really quickly to folks who, who may not be familiar with me. My name's Pete Kazanji. I am the founder of Atrium. Uh, Atrium makes data-driven sales management software. It's software that uh, exists to help sales managers, leaders, and reps uh, use metrics to improve their performance. Um, and uh, prior to Atrium, I started a uh, uh, a, a recruiting software company called Talentbin that was acquired by Monster Worldwide in 2014. And that's kind of where I went from being like a business generalist founder to like our first seller, our first sales manager, uh, then eventually our sales leader. And then when we were acquired by Monster, I was responsible for new product sales at, um, at Monster Worldwide. Uh, subsequent to that, I uh, wrote a book on, on startup sales called Founding Sales, and then also started... Um, uh, the nation's largest sales operations and leadership community, uh, uh, Modern Sales Pro. So that's a, a little bit on on me there. So so yeah, Manny, you were kind of mentioning the the outreach. I wanted to get the opportunity for folks to kind of hear the outreach foundation uh, story um, because like I don't know if there's a lot of organizations that were like in the sales tech space that were pivots. Um, maybe you can share a little bit of like where outreach came from and kind of like what inspired the, the initial spark. Yeah. So you were so close to this, Pete, that you're, you're, you're going to get a special, the, the, the special access to, to the story. All right. The other I love it. So, <laughs> So we, we had a, a, a marketplace that we believe was going to revolutionize sales hiring. Uh, yep. We were going to match buyers, meaning um, employers, and sellers, yep. meaning em employees or people looking in talent looking for, for, for a new place, we, you know, with yep. a mix of profiles and matching, et cetera. Well, right. we got the marketplace up and running, and it was not quite working. I wasn't getting liquidity. Mm -hmm. And right. in December 2013, that liquidity, that lack of liquidity meant that the company itself only had two months of cash left. Fine. When you are a company that is not growing and is trying to figure out a way out, there is no funding available to you. So the only way for us to get out of the hole was to execute. Right. So and to sell our way out. So we 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 took a step back, my co-founders and I, and we decided to completely stop working on the product on the marketplace and mm -hmm. work on whatever will generate sales. Mm -hmm. So we decompose. The, the, you know, we were very early and we were very naive. So we decompose sort of like the principal components of sales, if you would. And right. one is communication, the second one is meetings and the next one opportunity to close. Right. So we figured that if, if there's a way for us to reach to both to talent and to employers mm -hmm. in a personalized way and then follow up that we're gonna get some increase in, in meeting right. and, and conversations and then and conversion. Um, so we, we build an engine internally that would take a profile, we'll find whatever we could, 
out of that profile yep. and then mm -hmm. give it to a, 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 an ecosystem of writers. So they will come in and they would write subject line and they would mm -hmm. write the uh, intro line. Really? And then, and then we will compile that into a pitch that was A-B tested, of course. And then that will go out either to an employer and to a, or, to a, or to a talent or to a, okay. to a, person, to a person we wanted to target. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the engine will follow up with, you know, sort of like automated but personalized, you know, follow up. Yep. Right? You get to yep. see it. The, the result of that was a 40% reply rate in cold emails. Wow. And, 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 and it became really profitable really quickly because we will pay, I don't know, somewhere between 25 cents to, a, to, to 50 cents per email generated. Yeah. And as the writers came in and they got better at it, you know, we sort of, you know, you know the, 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 the bad ones promoted the good ones. And right. then the email reply rate got even better and better and better and better. So we were <laughs> swimming in interactions and now we're right. swimming in meetings. But now I'm in month one of my two months left of cash without generating cash, but generating a lot of meetings. So now Great. I have one month to actually turn this around, go to, um, uh, 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 to recruiters, to agency recruiters, right. and see if I can sell them meetings, right? I, can I be your yeah. appointment center? Sure. And I'm always kind of weird for them, as you know, like they don't do that. So yeah. they look at me and he's like, how are you generating these meetings? But I'm like, well, you know, we're, we build this engine that personalizes and follows up and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, stop. I want to buy the engine. I don't want to buy your, your uh, the meetings. <laughs> and I, I actually was pitching. I'm like, you plug this in to, to talent bin and you have a machine, right? You will be swimming mm -hmm. in meetings with candidates or, or, or with uh, employers in no time. So, you know, after getting that feedback so many times, we decided to make a small pivot. You know, we asked the board, we play a little bit of poker with the board. I mean, like, look, the company can just fold or we have this other <laughs> idea that, that turns out that's <laughs> back and, and is getting people's, you know, eyebrows raised. And you can put, you know, you can put $100,000 in it or we can just go home. And they were like, ah, oh, all right. So, <laughs> so fast they, forward, at, you know, December you 2014, the product is ready. We're selling it. And Jason Lemkin comes up with the word sales stack in one of his yeah. many disaster publications. And we were part of the stack. So now you needed to buy CRM and other things. And all the cool kids were buying other things. You were part of the cool kids back then because you were <laughs> yeah. off savant. And, <laughs> and, and, and the a stack became a real thing. And, 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 you know, after that, we took off and, you know, rest that's, cr that's crazy. And, and I think the, the, what's interesting there is that, I knew that, that the company was a pivot out of the, the talent marketplace, but I didn't realize that um, I didn't realize that there there was like recruiters who were telling you like, well, I would like to buy your your uh, engagement in software, and you're like, and but then you know, obviously there are way more salespeople and 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 uh, and SDRs than there are um, than there are recruiters, and um, you know, uh, when they do more activity and have more meetings, they, uh, it turns into revenue, which you know, right. Right. probably has a high, higher propensity to buy than, um, right. recruitment, mar recruitment, marketing automation. That's, uh, that's, that's really fascinating. And, and the way it actually happened, it, it was actually a singular incident where we were, we sold our, one of the first customers was App Dynamics, which, you know, was super hot five years ago before they sold to Cisco. And we sold to the recruiting team and I was trying to sell more licenses and they were like, many were out of recruiters. Like, mm. you know, just don't have that many, but like, you should really talk to our SDR team. We're really hiring strongly there. And they have, they do the same job. So they took my hand. They walked me over to the SDR pit and right. Like walked over, like call the, uh, you know, Joe, the SDR manager. Like Joe would take a look at this thing. And like, I did the demo. I was like, all right, stop. We need that right now. We sold <laughs> 20 licenses in the building. And after that, I called my co-founder on the way out. Hey, I have a better idea than <laughs> selling to recruiting. That's that's hilarious, man. I'm on one of the other um, fireside chats for um, for the RevX Fest here. Uh, I I chatted, I've been talking with Robert Wabe from um, from High Spot, yeah. and um, he was he was talking about how so many of the good ideas that they've like codified in High Spot has come from watching customer behaviors and like watching watching the desire pass. It's really fascinating to hear that. Like it was a, it was a similar situation there. Um, so so. Um, you know, like nobody, um, like nobody knew about group talent, um, the, the prior company. Now everybody knows about, about outreach. Um, how did the company kind of go from, 
like this initial insight around like, oh, I have a better idea. It turns out these SDRs could really use the heck out of this to kind of like the, the next stage, not all the way to like sales execution, because I want to get into that a little bit later, but like, you know, what was the next couple of years? What do the next couple of years look like um, once you guys kind of found that, that crazy product market fit around sales engagement to SDR populations? Yeah. The, the first thing, the first aha moment was that it was everything was around the, 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 the main insight was not the ability to send out a lot of emails or make a lot of calls. It's mm-hmm. to string together our workflow. Mm-hmm. And, and our, you know, the, our initial primitive workflow was, you know, it could be email, email, you know, call or whatever, but then you could put like a, like a, like a, like a, like a null step or like a, like a wait step and say like, go do research sure. or like sure. go text or like an action. do something else. Right. And the idea is that, is that by, um, by generating these workflows, you remove the cognitive load of somebody trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah. And by giving them that and, and removing the cognitive load, then you allow the SDR or the, or whoever is prospecting to be in the zone of whatever you're doing, whether you're cold calling or whether you're, 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 you know, you're sending emails or you're researching, you know, as, as you know, to get into the flow, you need to be, you need to repeat the action for several, you know, several times in a, in a span yep. of say, five minutes, right? Like a, like a Pomodoro activity type. Right. So when we brought this along, like the, the, the amount of people who were using it in that, in that sense, just exploded. And all of a sudden efficiency went through the roof because you're getting the same people to generate way more activity. And then the activity got better over time because the more you do it, the more the, the, you know, the, more the machine learns and the more, yep. you know, the better the outcome of that activity. So the, the single insight was that you needed to move from like single activity to workflow of activities. And then once you do that and you, and then you schedule the day for, for the, for the, you know, whoever is doing the pipeline generation uh, yep. so that they don't have to think about it. Then you're yeah. actually opening, so it's counterintuitive. You're actually opening up their mind space to do other things that are more valuable as opposed to organizing. Right. And that, that's what really took off. And, and then yeah. that's the kind of insight that we carry through as we went from sales engagement to sales execution. The other point that is super important is that every founder has this dilemma, and I'm sure you did too. Am I a new category or am I an existing category in a different way? And you can mm-hmm. argue this 20 ways, you know, it's a bit of a judgment call, but I think we, we, we bet on, on creating a new category and it was the right bet mm-hmm. um, because then that's how sales engagement got born. And now that yeah. is the thing that everybody understands. Like if we're still evangelizing sales execution, but everybody understands engagement. Yeah. 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 I, I think the, 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 the thing that you referred to earlier about like removing the, like the overhead yeah. Um, and just like making it such that people can just execute, but then what they can do is they can bring to bear their creativity in that execution um, versus like, th- we kind of talk about this at Atrium quite a bit where, um, you know, we, our primary users are sales managers, so like AE managers, SDR managers, you know, sales leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the things that we talk about in, with respect to management is like, we don't want people to have to like search around looking for the problems to solve. We want them to be in the business of solving the problems, right? So like, you know, the, the, our, our software should, software can identify the issues by like looking at metrics that are problematic on a rep basis or team basis or whatever. And it's like, hey, like Bobby's got a win rate problem. You know, his win rate problem is in, you know, like coming out of proposal. Susie's got an average sales price problem. It's because like her average op size is too small different sets of problems, but like now, because they've been identified, you as a manager can go fix those. Similarly, let's not think about like, oh, what should I do next? But it says like, here you go, you got to send it, you know, you got to call this person right here who has already gotten these two emails previously. So, you know, get excited to like, you know, get gussied up to have like the best call um, right now, because you don't have to have all the cognitive load in order to um, to like think about what I ought to do next. Right. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, uh, you guys are based in, in Seattle, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of organization, you know, kind of like the, the, the bigger kind of high flying SaaS organizations are oftentimes like in the Bay area, you know, potentially in, in, in like New York, et cetera. Um, what has it been like kind of like building in the outside, um, you know, building outside of the Bay area? Um, is it a competitive advantage? How has it been a competitive advantage? Like, how does that work? Um, it's working well now, but it hasn't, it wasn't always this way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. when we started, Seattle was, 
a little bit out of anyone's you know purview. And there yeah. are not that many wins, especially in B2B SaaS, especially mm. in sales tech, right? Yeah, and, definitely not in sales tech. Right. And they a hundred percent of our customers for the first two years of our life were not in Seattle. Yeah. And and that was that was kind of sobering and hard, right? Because you know, it's easy when you can walk out of the building and, and walk into a customer. Yeah. And in Seattle, we didn't have the luxury to do that. Uh, the second thing that was hard is that you know I, we didn't raise from Seattle, so other mm. than our very small seed fund or seed round uh, from our angel investors, um, you know none of the big money came from Seattle. Mm. So you know every you, we have to we have to develop this presence. Like a matter of fact, like a lot of people thought that I that that you know I am that we were based in San Francisco, but <laughs> I actually moved to San Francisco. You know, you oh, and really? I met in San Francisco when I was living there. I was living in, oh, in, in the outer Richmond. Yeah. Oh, I and, didn't realize that. And yeah, the, and the reason I did that is because we needed to appear to be a San Francisco company to get the momentum, to get the benefit of the doubt, and to get the investment and to get the early customers. What I love about the Bay Area is that, you know, anybody will try your tool. And right. number one, number two is everybody's very, it's like they were built on top of each other, right? So like you either in the, in the SOMA or you're in the fi in financial district and there's like, you go to a building and every floor has a different startup. You can hit them all yeah. on the way up and close <laughs> the way down and get invited to the party after. You see what I mean? So like the bars are full of like the VPs and like the directors of sales and ops and you can mingle and sale right there or fundraise. Yeah. So walk into a bar and I got really good at making people part with 10 grand. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like, that's how we survived through the pivot, actually. So the um, the early days were hard, but now Seattle's established market. It's actually seen yep. as, a, as a, you know, you know, with, with Auth and, and with Avalara and with Aptio and... and DocuSign, DocuSign right? and Smartsheet. Us. Exactly. Yep. So it, it's, it, it has, you know, the the weight and the gravitas to be a real a real thing. But we were a logging town for the longest time. You know, I mean, this, this, this is where you go on your way to Vancouver, Canada. You know, I mean, like, supposed to like, you know, where you're gonna put some sales tech. The uh, yeah. the, the, the the advantage of having being early through this transition is that a lot of people who work at Amazon or Microsoft who wanted to work at a startup, yeah, didn't have a, didn't have a lot of choices. So we had sure. a lot of that momentum coming in um, that really benefited us, and that really benefited us in the sense that we were able to to really grab some really, really juicy talent out of, out of Microsoft that had experience mm -hmm. in real-time conversational intelligence, for instance. And we were mm -hmm. able to, you know, do things that were magical that were not possible if it wasn't for that talent. So, it, it, you know, I, I think it's, it's beneficial. And I don't think I would have been able to do the same thing in the Bay Area. Yeah, it's a good point. Like, yeah, a lot of, lot of competition for, um, you know, for, for humans in the, uh, in the Bay Area. Um, well, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of like going from being um, a, a primary solution that had like pretty wild product market fit in the form of sales engagement um, to, to now a broader sales execution um, platform. And, um, you know, I think that you guys have been, have been building and also acquiring some, some companies as of late. Um, what, like, A, what is inspiring that? And then B, how is that, like, modifying how outreach goes to the market, how it talks to the market, you know, how it represents itself in the market, et cetera? Yeah. It's a, it's a really... It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question because it's a little bit of like, how do you decompose luck? You see what I mean? <laughs> like, I would love to tell you that I'm great and I, of course, saw this coming, et cetera. But there is a lot of luck in what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of luck in, in, that, in that if you really, if you're really obsess about delivering for your customer, yeah, that wins you a conversation about yeah. what else is broken, right? So you are the, you know, you come in and you do yes. a, a QBR, Mm -hmm. you know, to see how things are going. And after the QER is over and you're in the, in the drinking, you know, having a few meals yeah. part of the QBR, and you were like, you know, what, what else is this screwed up? And they were like, oh, just I'm glad you, you, you asked me that. I got, I got this problem in conversion. I got this problem with my funnel. I got this problem with my SMB team. I got this problem. Blah, 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 blah. And you sit there and taking notes. And I'm like, holy shit, all this stuff is broken? Really? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. and you and you yeah. sort of like catalog problems. And so my, my co-founder, uh, Andrew, was obsessed on like cataloging this problem. He was like a problem hunter. 
right? And because <laughs> he grabbed into a problem, he's like, what's behind the Love problem? It. What's behind the problem? What's behind the problem? <laughs> so he really became obsessed with cataloging these problems. And, and that's what sort of like gave us insights into, into how do you, you know, we, okay, so what's broken in the AE workflow? In the, a, in the, you know, the SDR workflow is very deterministic, right? So you have yeah. all the people you want to call and then you do all the steps to, to sort of get a hold of them and your, yeah. your output is a meeting or a qualified sales support. Sales, sales yeah, support I can off. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. An AE has all these other milestones, right? Like, so they have, yeah. you, know, you know, identify pain, identify buyer, identify, you know, constituents who are going to be part of it. Like they, all these things that are happening in each of them are different. So... The, it, it was the observation that there was no real solution as you went down the path yeah. that gave us this insight that, okay, so maybe we should, you know, we should, A, build something for, for, for the A's. And once you did that thing for the A's, then the next question is like, how, how are you going to forecast based on this new information that you have, right? Because right. previously you forecast based on the opportunity object and a bunch of other stuff that is happening. Right. But, you know, you know just like usually like you did, like they, we, we, the, the forecast is mostly done by the first like by the first line manager understanding what's going on with their AEs and then passing yep. something up. You know, and that includes how much are you coaching, how much you believe this rep versus this other rep, how much like there's all these right. nuance into it that you don't take into account. So so what 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 we love about the space is that it's nothing but a big bag of human problems that were never solved the way that ERP was solved or the way that marketing automation was solved. Yeah. And, and, and there's this gift that keeps on giving. So, I, yeah, I think that's a really good insight because I think at the end of the day, the, cr the, the crux of where a lot of those, like this big bag of problems comes from is that in order to do like sales necessarily has to be executed by people. Uh, and the reason why is because they're, you know, they're, pers they're, they're interacting with the counterparty, right? They're persuading them. They're helping to navigate the internal buying process or whatever. And so the problem is unlike marketing automation, which is like very deterministic, right? Um, like, you know, I can, I can chart a path, et cetera, et cetera. Like, like there's not someone kind of like fighting back, if you will, maybe it's the wrong yeah. phrase, but like, you, like there's, there's not like a counterparty who's like being squirrely. And so, um, and so like, that's why you need humans in order to like interface with that counterparty and like be persuasive and empathetic and, and so on and so forth. But the challenge of course, is that that, that like humans are messy. Right. And so provi providing them with like guardrails. And so yeah, it's funny that, uh, and I, I wonder if that's like what begets like the the kind of the proliferation of like the sales stack, if you will, in order to kind of help what is essentially like, um, I don't want to say a necessary evil, but like a really important thing in sales is like the human component of it. But then you come a lot, like we're all people, I'm, you know, I'm a person and like we're all fallible, right? So like you get the upside of like high empathy, high persuasion, high communication, but then you have the downside of them being fallible. So you need a bunch of like tooling around that's in order to, to kind of help um, facilitate that. And so I guess that's like kind of like what, what we're all doing is like, you know, just going down the going down the list of like figuring out like what the next critical path is, like what the next biggest constraint is with respect to SDRs or AEs. In our case, it's like helping sales managers be right. better, like be better because again, they're just human and <laughs> what you're trying right. to do. Like you, you can't have a human. robot manage them. Yeah, exactly. You can't have like, you can't have like a robot manage people because like, good luck, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, but so what we have to do is, yeah. So I think that like, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Like, I wonder if that, that just means that like the, like our category or sorry, like our, our industry uh, um, will always have like next things that it's kind of contending with um, because, because there's like that human component in it in, until like, you know, you don't need humans to sell, which I don't think is it's kind of going to take a while there. I would imagine. There's two, there's two important things that you said there. So unlike other parts of the organization where you're trying to remove human from the equation in sales, you have to actually make the humans more productive, more, you know, better at what they do. Because the, the fact that seller, that buyers are more informed before they come through the funnel makes the human actually actually more important than before. Because right. you know, you know, before you can get away with being instructive and being, you know, a good library of knowledge. Now you have to right. be really good at putting yourself in your, in your buyer's mind and anticipate a bunch of need and like yep. pattern matching, like you know, emotion match and do all these things that are part of the sales process. So that's one, one, that's one aspect that actually, you know, elevates the role of the human as opposed to diminishes. The other one is the fact that little changes, like little improvements throughout the funnel have incredible amounts of impact in the bottom yeah. line. 
Right. You, don't, you can't say the same in ERP, right? Like a 10% improvement, ah, whatever. A 10% improvement at the top of the full is massive, yeah. you know, to the amount of close one. So yep. there are so many angles in which you can come at it. And like, like, for instance, you can find other points of leverage. Like a manager is a point of leverage, right? Because a manager had a one mm-hmm. to six, one to 10 ratio. You improve the manager, yep. you improve 10 people. You improve the yep. people on how they, you know, discover or how they qualify or how they ch- build champions. And you get this again, this like multiplier effect of like, you know, the little numbers turning into big numbers. Yep. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about is, um, you know, be, I, I think because, I mean, you guys were definitely like out in front of the pack when it came to um, sales engagement, the, the accidental insight of the uh, <laughs> recruitment marketing <laughs> automate, so recruitment marketing automation applied to, um, we're, applied to sales. We're lucky. Hyper yeah. Lucky. Yeah. Well, you know, sounds like I can, I'll take it all day long. Um, but but I think what a lot of people like very quickly recognize, they're like, oh, wow, this is pretty rad. Um, and it became a very competitive space in, um, in short order, right? Um, there have been, you know, some, only a handful of folks who have really gotten to, to scale, but it was a super, con- like super competitive space. Um, how did you guys kind of navigate that and, and contend with that both at the beginning when there was like, you know, a dozen, you know, folks kind of like fighting it out even to the last like, you know, 12 to 24 months where there's, you know, um, two, three, four kind of like big players that, um, you know, that, that, that people kind of like, oh, that are household names. How, like how, how has it been in like executing in such a competitive environment? It, it's been, um, it's been rewarding in that because we're so early into the market, any new <laughs> competitor that comes into it helps you amplify the signal of like what engagement is sure and and so that that means that for every dollar of marketing that i get i get i get three dollars from you know other competitors and other people who want to get into it because even salesforce wants to get into the market too so they have an engagement product etc that they want to they're 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 sort of like trying trying different ways of like you know you know selling you an inferior thing right by by bundling and by giving (laughs) it away for free by doing this other thing by giving it to you behind the back like there's all this dynamics that happen but at the end of the day, the more the market talks about it, the more we all benefit. And as long as you are the leading product, you, you're going to be okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know that competitively, you know, we have mastered this craft yet. Because at the same time that we were born, G2 Crowd was born. And that became its own dynamic of like, how do you win that? You know, the forester and, and gardeners and whatever of the world, um, you know, are supposed to be this, this other arbiter of what's good and what's bad. You know, but their relevance is sort of like in, in, in motion, right? And you're trying to figure yeah. out, you know, how, how relevant that's going to be. And it turns out that just building the best product doesn't win either. So you also have to execute yep. the story. So frankly, you know, the competitive dynamic has, has, has made us more alert in all the things that we need to worry about as we continue to grow. Because completely, like, let, let's, let's all just get on the same page. All of us are in the kiddie pool. Right. Wish that we were in the adult part of the swimming, right? <laughs> the pool Not there is gonna get old for all of us, right? Like you know, a key pee, uh, you know, some kid peeing pee on the corner, and 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 you know, it's a little warmer than it should be, and you, you just want to get out of the kiddie pool. And the only right. way to get out of the kiddie pool is to scale different functions, right? You scale sales, you scale compete, you scale success, you scale marketing, etc. And you have to do it at broad scale, international, in different languages. So, you know, the, the competition at this scale has helped us sort of think through issues on how would they be when we are a lot bigger. Yeah, you know, this is why, like, we are at the scale that we are, and we still behave like a startup because that that com- com- you know co- continuously knowing competitive pressure helps us, you know, figure out like the three vectors we're gonna use to go and take care of this problem. Yeah, how big are you guys now? How many how many employees do you have? Twelve hundred. Oh wow! Holy mackerel! Jeez Louise! I can only we have we have seventy, and it's like. Oof. I know. Just like, I remember. I, I I memorize names at seventy eight. You know, what I mean, like I stopped memorizing at two hundred because it's like my memory just gave up. <laughs> but like I used to memorize all our customers, and now we have you know six thousand of them. And like I used to memorize a lot of our users, and now we have two hundred thousand. So like you know the the scale and how do you how do you stay personal and connected into the business as it grows is a real challenge, and I you know haven't figured it out that I'm on. Yeah, for sure. That's a, we're we're literally at that point from a customer account standpoint where. Um, getting too many customers to like remember them all right. um and then um the other funny thing this is like a like this is a champagne problem and i hope everybody has this problem in their in you know their sales experience but 
Um, you get to the point where you start having these customers that kind of like sound like each other and their names are just like <laughs> a little bit of like a little bit apart and like you kind of oh like mix God, up that's amazing. That's like mix mix them up just like a little bit like you know maybe like asana is your customer but then also like you know uh so, like samsara is as well and like you know uh and and like you're like oh wait, 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 wait who was the who was the RevOps person that i just had dinner with was it was it this one versus this one and this is why crm exists um <laughs> may, may we all have way too many customers to to be right we'll have that um, problem yeah absolutely yeah absolutely. may 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 i feel that's like a irish like uh drinking blessing or something like <laughs> you know, may, 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 may we all have this may we all have this problem um and, and okay so like you talked a little bit about um earlier about like hey like do you go off and create a category or do you try to like slot into something that already um already exists um what was like the hardest part of creating um you know creating the sales engagement category over the last eight years or so um it was the initial part. The hardest part was always the initial part when you don't even know whether you're right or not. You don't even know whether the name is going to be that, whether you know people would actually gravitate towards it. Um, because remember, we came from a world in which InsightSales.com was evangelizing something, right? Sales acceleration was what they call it. And they had put in a lot of work with Gartner to actually get them to define sales acceleration as a category, create a quadrant and blah, blah, blah. Right. And we were trying to like undo that. And tell people that it, there's no such thing as acceleration, right? Like there's every segment has a velocity. Every buyer has a velocity. Every, every, every deal has a particular velocity. And you're trying to like engage. And then, mm -hmm. and then the velocity becomes, you know, rate limited by the deal, not by this platform, right? Like the, you can't call any harder into closing, right? Like that doesn't exist. <laughs> So, well, you can, you can try, but it'll probably hurt your win rates as the, as your, your customer is like, Hey man, I'm used to like pushy salespeople, but like, Whoa, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So like, you know, so, so, so we were trying to undo a lot of that and get people to, to change their, their, their mindset into this thing. And I mean, we were, we had a lot of self doubt. Like, are we even right? Like who are, you know, who are we to check, create a category? Like, you know, a handful of kids in Seattle you know, and an immigrant and they don't know what they're doing, you know, barely, you know, he can barely speak English or what would he be creating a category? So there's all these things that I'm trying to get over myself and then our team. And then my team will like, you know, be frustrated one night and be like, man, why are we doing this? Like, why couldn't you just, you know, call ourselves like a lighter CRM or something and be done with it? And, mm -hmm. and so like the early, like, so the early conviction that you have to have to stick the landing on the category and like naming it and naming it and naming it and dropping it and everything you do and then, you know, getting aggressive and going to podcasts and talking to people and saying yep. the engagement was taxing and, and it felt like you were crazy. Oh, so yeah, like, totally. So like, so once you get past that. I feel crazy. I think that's a great description. You're good. But, you know, it's that, you know, you're on the border of like, are you crazy? You sound crazy because nobody else is saying what you're saying. So you must be crazy. So that yeah. part was hard. Yeah. I, um, so Nick Meta was another, um, he's another fireside chat. So CEO of Gainsight for uh, RevX Fest here. And we were talking about um, category creation and how, especially like Gainsight is you know, extremely early. Um, in customer success platforms. And <clears throat> he, we were kind of joking about how, you know, at least if like, if you're running in a direction and there's like a handful of other people that are like running with you, well, well at least it looks like a race. Whereas if you're just like by yourself, just like running in one direction, there's no one with you, you look like a crazy person. Right. And, um, and so I think that, yeah, you have to be like comfortable just, you know, repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating the, the, the thing that, you know, that you have a conviction in um, to the right folks. The other thing that I think that um, that Nick touched on that was really, um, really sharp is when you find the people who get it, all right? Like the way I kind of describe this is like, we all live in the future, right? Like the future that Atrium believes in is that it is table stakes, that managers use, you know, use metrics to, to they manage by metric, right? They're data driven, right? It's like, you know, money ball, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, we, and, and there's some people who live in the future, they're like most of the sales industry, like that, that's not well, you know, that's not well, not well understood. And then moreover, people don't do a good job of it. So you just have to, but when you find people who are in the future with you, and then moreover, like are kind of like on the cusp, you want to bear hug them as much as possible and like, you know, keep track of them. So 
and maybe part of it is like, so you don't feel as crazy or like you find the other crazy people and like, all right, great. Let's go like recruit other people into our, <laughs> in, in, into our, into our crazy farm here because, uh, because like, that's the only way we're going to like, you know, drive enough of the market into this, uh, this new category. How did you guys like facilitate um, kind of community um, in, um, you know, as you were kind of finding like other crazy people who are at that bleeding edge with, with, uh, with outreach? Um, so we, we, we have so few customers at the very beginning that it was easy to, to stick with just them. Knew them all. <laughs> just knew them you're, all just, you're just like, I message with them hey, what's oh, up? <laughs> all the time. And like, a lot of them are still here. And like, it was interesting because some of those customers had better performance on outreach than we did. So I, 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 I spent a lot of time kind of learning from them. I was like, wait, what are you doing? Like one of them was Jason doing? Vargas, Like Jason Vargas had... <laughs> 50% connection rates on, on call on outbound sequences back when he was a data analyst. He was just, he was a savant on outreach. And if he would like, you know what I mean? Like, so we get to learn a lot from our customers. Um, and the early adopters sort of really push your platform, sometimes yeah. healthily, sometimes unhealthily. So we build a lot of tech for this, like, you know, I want the cars to fly and fly fast and fly hot, you know, whereas I'm trying to sell to the people who are on horses. So yeah, yeah. that was a real struggle. It's like that is, it, yeah. The, the, yeah. the category doesn't get anointed until you get at least the early adopters to follow you. But if you're yeah. living in innovator land all the time, like where you know they already went to the future, came back and they want it now. Yeah, that, that was a lot of the struggle. And like you can't build a big a big tent if you don't bring anyone along. Yeah, that is tough. That is like I mean that is like definitely a product management conundrum. There, we're like. You 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 find those early believers. You bear hug them. You want to you want to keep them stoked. You want to give them presence, but you have to also recognize the the fact. Like I mean, you can only imagine. Like you guys do sentiment analysis and kind of responses and a bunch of other stuff right now. I can only imagine in like 2015, some of those like people were just like, "Hey, you know what you guys should do? You know what you guys should do? You should like grade what like, what the response is." And then you know, like if you invest your engineering resources in that, then you don't get the like, you know, basic governance things or like what things like, Hey, sales ops is not going to buy this. If like everybody can like, just like uh, swap Each out the custom thing, field. Copy it and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, like swap out the custom fields or like do something stupid or whatever. And like, see if you just build the like very meat and potatoes stuff, even though you know that there's like these crazy pants features in the, in the future, um, yeah, that's like a, that's a tough problem. But then to you solve. don't want to be like, you know, you don't want to end up like sales where you're nothing but meat and potatoes. And they're like, there's no spark. There's no like anything in it. Like, so the, the, the question is, is sort of like, this is where the art of, of entrepreneurship comes in. Right? Like you, you attune your ear on things that you know that you can build for the, the early adopters that will, will be truly recognized by the late adopters, right? So, so for instance, yeah. there, I remember this early, early user, Scott Wong. Uh, he's not working with Ortega. I think I read his labs, or, or, or maybe he's not. I forget where he went. But but um, we we hired him. Um, but before we we you know he came work for us. He was at a company that was really like pushing the envelope of where which was going. And they were like, look, I need to automate a lot more of what we do so that I can get my SDRs more at bats. And every for every person that we're trying to reach out to, we have disparate amounts of information. It's whatever we can find on them that is unique and important. Mm. And we have that algorithm sorted, but they need outreach to automatically do that. So that's why we created a programming language for email templates so that you can use if then statements and sort of like variables that we resolve real time to be able to use the most amount of knowledge that you had on anyone to be able to right. send the most comprehensively, you know, crafted email that you could automatically, right? right. So if it wasn't for Scott, we wouldn't have built that. Yes, I mean, but now that we build it, that's like level four of anybody using, you know, that kind of templating. Mm. And, and, right. it, and it's eventually, like, eventually we'll table stake, right? Oh, of course you can program, like, what a, the computer is trying to say. And, yeah. and, and the same thing now with sentiment, right? Like, we release sentiment for emails, and now people want sentiment for meetings. But, you know, what yeah. happens in a meeting is a meeting has a number of sentiments throughout. So there's no yeah. unique score for sentiment, but you have the opening sentiment, you have the pricing yeah. conversation sentiment, you have the closing sentiment, you have the next set sentiment. How did the rep do with each of those? So now you have to create this other, like you have to like take your vector and like make it into a metric, a matrix of, of sentiment and, and timings and, and outcomes and whatever. And like you say, do I build that for like the super advanced, you know, flying cars people or, or, or do I just like, you know, 
make the button a little rounder, you know, easier to click. <laughs> I mean, like, can I, oh, what, it, what is it in office space? Can I get this button in corn flour blue? Right. Can I, uh, <laughs> yeah, can, right, 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 right. Can I, right, exactly. I, I don't know, I, I don't know about if I'm, I don't know about this, this purple look and feel. Like, can I like, get a, right. can are, I get, you, are you going to theme it for Halloween? What are we doing for Halloween? Can I, you know what can I mean? I, like, can I get a, <laughs> well, but I think the other thing that you can do too is like when you get to a certain level of like engineering um, capacity and throughput, then like you can, uh, you were kind of noting this with, um, with Andrew Kinzer earlier, like you have your catalog of, um, you know, you have your catalog of, of problems that you're going after and like your catalog of ideas from customers or what have you. I mean, you guys are like now doing some pretty like whizzy stuff, right? Like, I mean, I think also the, the prevalence of and kind of the advancements in um, machine learning and AI and, and what have you has really like made a lot of those things that would have otherwise been like very high level of effort and like speculative, like potential upside, yeah. a lot lower, a lot lower level of effort and like less risky from an implementation standpoint. So, I mean, maybe you can talk about how some of the stuff that you guys have been doing that. Cause I think it folds really well with how you guys are expanding out of, you know, sales engagement to like sales execution. Like obviously Kaya is a great example of this. I know that you guys are doing some stuff in forecasting, which also has like ML, um, you know, uh, baked into it as well. Like how, how is that like infusing uh, Atrium's, excuse me, uh, Outreach's platform? Yeah, so one of the early um, sort of aha moments for us was that um, if you were to abstract sales, mm -hmm. sales is just a continuum set of conversations yep. with people coming in and out and with like the defined metrics for progress, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Do you discover the problem? Yeah. Do you discover, you know, the the, the people who, who who care about that problem enough to pay for it? Is that did that did you turn that person into a champion, etc.? So all this, um, all these milestones are are, are are so like hard to get to unless you you can guide a conversation towards it, and then then to a close. So mm -hmm. the what that insight gave us is that now we you know that plus the advances of nlp and the, and the, and the, and the fact that nlp got really really good at, at being yeah. both real time and and um and solving for the for the uh uh the uh, the um the, the accuracy uh, the, 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 yeah accuracy but the, the dimensionality problem the fact that you have like mm -hmm. so the, the problem in sales is that the words that don't happen all that often are the ones that matter the most sure you know what i mean so, so right, so it's just like you. So like, yeah, it, when that weird word shows up, like you got to like you you really got to get and we really got to catch it. Right. So what we did, our secret sauce is really how we train the machines. So once you have those insights, then we spend a lot of time. We have a huge, we have a big annotation team that all they do is is making sure that we're training the machines right, so that we catch those things that are hard to catch, so that they can mm -hmm. do it at scale later. And and that has been really our our. Um, our aha moment, and it's funny. Everything, everything you do in a company happens because of a person, right? You started the company, and and you got an insight. Then you hired the one guy that was obsessed about X, and then you hired the one guy that yep. was obsessed about Y, etc. So we hired one guy who was obsessed about, um, you know, really getting to the bottom of like what is what is what is true for a machine to understand about sales, and then it's chilling sure. it out. So he he created our what we you know our whole annotation pipeline program that then mm -hmm. allows us to feed two or three or four or five machine learning programs at any point in time, comparing both, see which one leads to a major outcome and then boom, that's a release. So we do that mm -hmm. now with regularity. Like we don't even think about it. Like there is, there is a team that is sort of like hypothesized and there's a team that is building, there's a team that is shipping. And that's just really give us a competitive advantage, but it wasn't, you know, it, 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 you know there's a, it, his name is Yifei. It, it wouldn't be done if it, because if it wasn't for Yifei. Yifei sort of came <laughs> out with like the grand idea to do it and then now we have it, right? So. There's always these leaps in, in like progress that you have because somebody made it so. You know what I mean? So this is why talent is so important because with, without that, like yeah. you know, for, for Kaya, literally Kaya was pitched to me by this guy, Abby, who is now one of my deep engineers, who was like, I have this great idea. You have to come work for you to implement this great idea. <laughs> like, the call lasted 30 minutes. I was like, yeah, let's do, let's do it. Like, you know, I took him, presented to the board and I said, we're going to approve a bunch of money to like get Kaya going because that's, there's no, there's no world in which the rep is not real time enabled. You see what I mean? Like, but there is all, you know, it's people that make, that make things. In the meantime, you sort of like flounder and grow a little bit and then you have, a, you know, the person who shows up and boom, you, you, you increase your, your rate by X percent. Yes, you need that. Yeah, you need those special people with the bias to action and like the the high high levels of give a shit um, who like really are obsessed with, you know, a specific thing. Um, 
but just kind of in um in kind of like wrapping up here um you know obviously um you know we've been talking about uh outreach as an expansion from sales engagement to sales execution a um, lot of kind of shifts going on in our industry right now what do you kind of see playing out over the next like 12 to 24 months in our uh in our industry um the, so the, this, this, the secular win, so, so the things that we're, you and I are looking at is our world is becoming dominated by this huge millennial sort of growth inside the organization. So your millennials are 40% of the workforce right now. You know, the oldest millennial is 42. Um, they're sort of like digital natives or digital hot, you know, digital sort of like bridges. And that's just going to continue. Right. So this, there's this, and then they're, then they're going to become man, managers and leaders. And oh, you and so already in that. They already problem. are. Yeah. They're already, yeah, they already leaders are. and managers. Like the majority yeah, exactly. of them are already, like, because they, if they don't get promoted within a year, they, you know, I'm just moving on to the next thing. So, like, mm -hmm. and, 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 but that's the new dynamic, right? So that we have to live with that. And they, you know, they care about promotion. They care about aligning values to, you know, are the values of your company align the values to who I am? You know, they're very diverse and they're very inclusive. So they want to see that in their lives. So they, you know, whether they're a buyer or seller, they want to see that in their environments. So there is, there's this, there's this like seismic shift in the demographic for, for sales or demographic in general, that is going to be reflected in the world of sales. So this is like, you know, we, we are about to get a tsunami of change in terms of digital transformation. So like in the, in the future, there will be, there will be no one that will, wouldn't want to manage their, you know, their team with, without your application. They just, they just won't. Right. And they won't right. accept it, right? Like they won't, they will show up into a, to a shop and be like, well, you don't have that? I, I can't work here. So, right. It's, it's kind of like, you know, how am I, how am I supposed to, uh, how am I supposed to ride this bike without like, you know, without any sort of like instrumentation on it? Like I'm used to a Peloton. Like this is, this is, cr this is crazy. Like, exactly. Like, wh what do you mean I can't talk to my computer? You see what I mean? Yeah. Like there's an Alexa almost in every room in my house and my kids are used to talking to walls. Just think about that. Walk into a room, <laughs> Alexa, turn on the light, tell me a story. You see what I mean? And like that already, that's already here. And like, you know, the, 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 this generation is just going to get more demanding and more exacting about what they expect from the technology. And we're, we're going to bear the brunt of it. It's funny. It's kind of like the consumerization of IT, but it's not really the consumerization of IT. It's like the digital nativity of, uh, of, of like B2B software. And like in this case, with respect to sales. Uh, wonderful. Well, Manny, this is super awesome. I appreciate the, uh, the high octane conversation. I'm sure our, I'm sure our audience is super, um, has been super illuminated by, um, you know, by everything that we discussed. Um, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, looking forward to hanging out the next time I'm in Seattle, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you to the team at Atrium for making this happen. See you. Cool. See you. See you, brother.